All right, it looks like the participants have kind of smoothed out, so I think we'll uh, get started. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining our, our ninth uh, CARS webcast of 2020, uh, which will be focusing on shifts in HR practices due to COVID-19. Uh, My name is Brad Bell. I'm a professor in the HR Studies Department, and I also serve as the Academic Director of CARS. Very happy today to be joined by my colleague, Beth Glenn Ferry, who serves as the Executive Director of CARS and also has over 25 years of uh, HR experience. Uh, the most prevalent HR operating model has been in existence for some time and is, is by far the most dominant model today, which we're all familiar with is consisting of uh, shared services, centers of excellence, uh, and the HR business partner. Uh, during COVID-19, uh, companies' approaches to their businesses and workforces have changed. Uh, necessitating HR to really kind of look at these different models and to consider whether they make sense uh, moving forward. Uh, CARS recently conducted a virtual working group on this topic led by uh, Beth in order to really better understand how CARS partners have shifted their model and or practices uh, as a result of the pandemic. So the goal of our webcast today is to share out some of the uh, findings uh, from that uh, working group, as well as to engage you in some discussion around some of the changes that you're seeing in your own organizations. So just to give you a kind of preview of what we'll be doing over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to start out by uh, engaging in a conversation with Beth, asking her some questions about some of the themes that emerge uh, from the working group. I'll also add some insights of my own uh, based on some working groups that we've done recently around uh, topics such as remote work uh, and employee health and well-being. Uh, during the discussion, please submit your questions uh, and comments. Uh, you can do so through the question and answer uh, button that you see at the bottom of the webinar. Uh, some of these we might tackle as we go through uh, the discussion, but we'll certainly leave some time uh, at the end uh, to engage in some, some Q&A. So with that, uh, Beth, again, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, originally this working group was really slated to focus on kind of the HR operating model and how COVID has impacted it or uh, driven changes in it. Um, so what did you actually find as you uh, engaged in the working group? Yeah, thanks, Brad. It's great to be here today. Thanks, everybody, for dialing in. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. We uh, periodically take a look and reach out to our partners to say, you know, where are we with that um, illustrious three-legged stool and how's it changing? And we thought with everything going on with COVID, this would be a good time to, to revisit that. Um, and while COVID, you know, really gets the lion's share of attention this year, um, the pandemic's really only one of many destabilizing crises for for our cars companies. So you've got the natural disasters, fake news, protests, mental health challenges that have all affected our employees. Um, and despite these hardships this year has also been one of rising to the challenge for companies with HR at the center. So really proud of our, our companies and our teams there. Um, and while companies approaches to their businesses and workforce have definitely changed as a result of all this, um, we found that uh, major HR operating model shifts are really not yet underway, but there are a number of HR practices shifting that could signal the start of some larger changes. And companies have had, have had to adopt flexible, responsive, and transformative practices really to adapt to this. Great, so uh, maybe we could talk a bit about some of the kind of key areas that seem to be under uh, transition, so to speak. Yeah, we, we talked really about five main areas during, uh, during the working group. The first one was around communications and uh, the growing role of that, given how important it is now and, and how important it is with the, with the shift to remote work. The second was leadership and decision making um, and where the locus used to be business need around how leaders were making decision, uh, how it's shifted more towards personal needs uh, for folks. The third was performance management you know, some companies are foregoing performance management this year and not doing it at all. And so one question we had was, is this the start of a broader transformation trend or really a just for now type of moment? Um, the fourth one, uh, which you're really familiar with is uh, remote work. Is it here to stay? Is it just for now? Um, and, you know, what's balancing the need for today, crystallizing your employee value proposition uh, for returning to the office and anticipating longer term realities. 
And then the last one was um, health, well-being, and inclusion. So, you know, companies are looking to enhance their benefits to support mental health and well-being um, with particular focuses on working parents, as well as ensuring all talent is kind of seen uh, in a world where distancing and remote work may become more the norm. Great. So maybe what we could do is uh, take a few of these one by one and kind of talk a bit about, you know, uh, what changes we're seeing uh, and maybe what's driving that. And again, I would encourage uh, those of you uh, watching, please, uh, you know, share your own thoughts uh, in the chat uh, around these different themes, but around others as well that maybe you're seeing your organization that we could uh, hit on as well. So maybe we can start with the communication theme that you mentioned. You know, I think we all understand why communication is, is so important uh, today. Um, so, but how are companies, you know, adapting their communications uh, given the current environment and thinking about communications moving forward? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's unsurprising, right, that the, the crises have made communications a, a bigger challenge along with the remote work. And I think companies have really struggled to find a balance between too much communication, um, which causes a lot of wading through emails and you know what should you focus on and that type of thing, but too little communication as well, where people are feeling um, you know alone and maybe not totally understanding what's happening during these times. Um, uh, so you know it's really kind of finding striking that balance between. Uh, repeat messaging over communication and, and striking the right tone. Other companies we found have really struggled to disseminate general information globally. Um, countries are in different stages of lockdown and, and uh, governments are addressing things in different ways. Um, and so that's been really difficult for our companies to really figure out, you know, how do we communicate to whom and where. Um, and, you know, messages tend to be diluted as they get passed down through leadership levels. And that's a, that's a real challenge. So at the beginning of the crisis, as you would normally expect, you know, we're all looking to our leaders um, and our companies focused really on top down direct communications approaches. Um, and I believe that certainly is, was the right approach at the time to kind of have that one message delivered from, from the top and then, you know, everybody hearing the same thing. But now um, companies are really shifting towards a more bottoms up approach. Um, they're using things like surveys, they're using their employee resource groups, uh, to really better understand concerns from the employee perspective, because this is this is all new, right? It's all new to leaders. It's all new to the employees, and so this bottom up bottoms up approach seems to be more dominant right now. And the the surveys seem to also be uh, done a lot more frequently, and I think that's uh, very helpful because that allows us um, to uh, to question, you know, send questions out, ask our employees more frequent with more frequency what's happening for our leaders and HR to adjust our messages, adjust our policies, uh, whatever needs to happen, uh, given how dynamic this this is. Um, and it also helps inform the right channels for communication, because we know everybody receives information differently. Um, and so we have to deliver it up, serve it up in many different ways. So it's it's received and heard by our employees. So the ship from kind of top down to maybe bottom up or at least the mix makes a lot of sense. You, you start out by talking about kind of the frequency of communication and uh, the, I guess, the risk of overwhelming employees. So in, was there a discussion around over time has the kind of frequency uh, diminished in the sense of have companies maybe, uh, you know, kind of backed off a little bit in terms of uh, the amount of messaging going out to employees? Yeah, I, I definitely think that's the case. And I think at first, you know, um, it was it was so shocking and so new to everybody. We were just communicating as we needed to, and things were changing so much at the beginning. Um, and so now, I think what companies have done is really found their rhythm, right? So they've they've you know for their culture, for their leaders, you know, when is it that they're going to push something out? So are are, are you going to get something from your president or your d division leader or whatever? And you know to expect that on a monthly basis, a weekly basis, whatever the right rhythm and, and culture is for your organization, and then really set up these cascading plans um, to make sure those messages continue down through the organization um, and are delivered consistently, but maybe again in different channels to hit our you know, different pieces of the workforce in, in the most effective ways for them. Great. 
So the, the second theme that you mentioned was leadership. And obviously this has even been touched on in this communication theme as well as leaders being a key conduit of information and communication to employees. But what other uh, issues or shifts did you hear in the group around uh, leadership? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, leadership is more important than ever, as we know. Um, and companies, our cars companies have really leaned into their managers more than ever. Um, because, you know, the employees are spread out across the world, they're spread out, you know, in their homes, and they're looking for that contact in their ear, you know, their natural reaction is to, is to lean into their managers. And so um, what, what, during this working group, what we talked about more was more training being provided to these managers, um, encouraging them, and, you know, maybe sometimes requiring them to check in with their staff more frequently, um, to get more flexible with how they approach things. And um, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, many of our companies have seen decision-making shift from a business first focus, so business need, business necessity, that type of thing, to more of a personal need, right? Um, and that's putting more emphasis, emphasis, <laughs> however you say that word, on empathy and compassion, right? And, and that has really allowed leaders during these remote work times a really unique opportunity, which many of them are taking advantage of to share more of their personal lives, right? Show their dogs on, on their Zooms or their cats or their kids um, and, and be more authentic and show more emotional intelligence with their teams. And I think that is, is a really nice outcome um, of this whole situation. But I think it also uh, it does show that you know, we've talked for years about learning mindsets and growth mindsets and how important that is. Um, and it really is being further emphasized right now. Um, leaders need to adapt quickly to these unforeseen challenges. Um, managers need to find creative ways to support their staff and, and communicate company messaging really effectively. And so we have to be more agile um, and, and learning oriented uh, than ever. Yeah, it's interesting that the you know, kind of the humanization of leadership. I, I did a working group over the summer on leadership development, you know, with people, cars partners that were in charge of that within their companies and, you know, talking about how that's shifting to virtual, but that was a key theme that came out. It's really an opportunity to add more of that human element as we try to think about leaders and their roles and supporting employees, uh, having showing empathy to employees, really um, breaking down some of that distance that I think is often separated leaders and their direct reports. Yeah, there's nothing like shared experience, you know, to bring people together. Yeah. So uh, maybe before we go on the next thing, we did get a question that came in that I think we can tackle now um, from Crystal around back to the communication theme, asking kind of how personalized or specific have the messages become? Uh, do we, you know, did you hear kind of broad messaging or has it kind of been focused more to messages to particular groups? And it, based on what you were saying earlier about this kind of bottom up approach coming out of the ERGs and others, I'm guessing that that's kind of made it more tailored to specific employee populations. But can you yeah. maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, we didn't get into too much depth here, but definitely, you know, when it was leader led communication from the top, those were very broad uh, sweeping messages. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I and as thing as things have evolved, certainly things have gotten more specific. I, I also think that, you know, with this lean into manager type of thing, our managers have, have gotten more skilled here, right? The HR teams have helped them be more skilled and to think about not only um, expressing that that centralized general general message that they're hearing from um, the more centralized groups or from the higher level leaders, but to then put their own lens on it to say, okay, if, if my workforce is on the plant floor, you know, how do I need to take that message and, and shift it or, or apply it more to what's happening within that group? And the same for, you know, headquarters groups, um, you know, marketers or or you know, support staff type of thing. And so I, I really think we heard that our managers have grown in this respect. Um, the expectations are higher, that they are doing that, that kind of thing, and, and they're getting better at it. And again, as you mentioned, Brad, um, with the, the bottoms up approach with, with them being more informed by, hey, here's what our parent ERG is saying about their struggles. I think they, you know, they feel like they they again are, are learning and are more educated and more able to. Uh, to help apply, you know, those communications more broadly. Right. 
Thanks for the question, Crystal. An another one just came in from Prasad. Uh, can you share an example of a shift in decision making to focus on personal need? And I know later we're going to, you know, hit on this theme of uh, employee uh, health and well-being. And you know, we did a recent working group on that, and I think that was a central theme that I heard in that working group was, yeah. you know, every group and it, you know, to some extent, almost every employee has their own individual challenges. They have their own needs. You know, so really, this idea of, you know, we need to be careful not to fall in the trap of a one size fits all approach as we think about you know providing support and services and programs to our employees but really kind of recognizing that the needs are often going to really differ across employees and address those more at the individual than kind of the organizational level but i don't know if any examples maybe came up in your discussion yeah the really the really easy uh, example is flex work arrangements um and you know it used to be that um yeah as employees applied for those types of things they had to show how they met a business need um and nowadays it's more about your personal need driving that so for example if you've got kids working from home if you're caring for um for uh, sick, sick folks in your house or, or something like that, you know, your workday may have to be scaled in a different kind of way. And in the past, it would have been taboo to ask for that based on those personal circumstances. And today, uh, that's shifting. And, and businesses are realizing, you know what, we need to approach this differently. And so you, you obviously have to have to fulfill your role and, and do what your job, you know, needs to be done. But uh, companies will offer much more flexibility in accommodating what those needs may be for flexibility, given your own personal circumstances. Yeah, great example. So we had another question come in, which actually is a good segue to our next theme around performance management. Uh, the question is really, you know, this idea that some companies are maybe foregoing it, uh, you know, performance management in the near term, which is certainly an interesting trend and I guess raises a question about, is that just a kind of temporary pause or maybe is that uh, harboring of, you know, things to come? Uh, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that issue as well as others that you heard in the working group around how companies are addressing performance management in the current context. Yeah, yeah. You know, pre-pandemic, we were all talking about performance management, you know, a few years back and, and uh, companies moving to no performance ratings and, and those types of things. Um, most CARS companies that were uh, a part of the working group had left their performance management processes, and I emphasize that, largely unchanged, right? You know, if you think about a, a, a model and when you should change things, certainly external factors are uh, a part of when you do that. But I wouldn't say that in the midst of those external factors, you should really look at overhauling your whole performance management system. Um, and so the, the fact that these cars companies um, were largely unchanged, I think is, is the right approach given, given where we are right now. Um, the bigger challenges though for companies have been, you know, how they've been impacted by the pandemic from a financial sense. So for example, you know, some companies are vastly exceeding their financial expectations, right? Due to the products they provide and the services they provide, that type of thing. And of course, others um, are underachieving due to these unusual circumstances. And so really what's happened, um, the, the discussions have really focused more on the impact um, to, you know, the external market impact to their internal reward systems, right? Pay bonuses, you know, those types of things. And so, um, so, so obviously you're, you probably are at two, two different extremes. If you have financial constraints, you know, you're not going to be giving bonuses. Um, and, and one thing we talked about there then was, okay, how do you keep morale up? And how do you emphasize why performance management is still important during those kinds of times? Because, you know, many of our employees, unfortunate uh, to us in HR who are, or have been trying to separate this, they only see it as a pay mechanism, right? As opposed to a, a feedback type of um, mechanism. And so, so those were some of the struggles that, that were, were brought up. Um, others on the other end of the spectrum who have um, really benefited financially during these times have talked about, okay, what are the temp temporary types of things we need to look at adding for our workforce during this time and, and emphasize temporary because they don't necessarily think these market dynamics are gonna last a long time. And so again, you don't wanna shift your whole performance management system right now, but you do wanna look at 
you know, uh, flexibility due to COVID related factors with bonuses and time worked and hazard pay and, you know, all those, all those kind of things. Um, and so, uh, so I think you just do need to be really careful and think more about um, how long is this going to last? What's the real impact here? And, and what should that mean? And how we think about um, reward systems. And I think um, as we do go forward, companies um, will really have to focus more on the feedback aspects. So we've never been great at that, you know, and, and certainly uh, in the performance management discussions we had pre-pandemic, um, there was a lot of, of focus on more frequent informal uh, feedback as part of performance management. Um, and now we need to add in the remote aspect. And we also need to add in the fact that, you know, who do you solicit feedback from? Who are people interacting with? How do you get that information? And what are the things we need to do to, um, to ensure people are getting the feedback they need uh, going forward? So that's where I think we'll focus next. Great. So uh, another question came in from uh, Kathy at Corning, uh, kind of touching on another theme we were gonna hit on around kind of remote work, flexible work. Um, kind of asking the question about what's the ROI, the kind of cost benefit of allowing more flexibility from working from home. She kind of notes that, you know, uh, in their organization, uh, there's about 80% of employees that need to report to a, a factory, uh, right? So uh, how do we um, kind of evaluate this? Uh, you know, maybe I'll start, uh, Kathy, just in terms of, you know, I'll speak to kind of what we know from research, right? In the sense of there's been a lot of studies looking at flexible work and uh, in particular kind of remote work. And what they show pretty conclusively is, um, you know, a positive effect on employee, you know, performance, right? So it's not a huge effect. Uh, I would say in general, we see effect of maybe five to 10% kind of increase in employee performance, uh, you know, working remotely as compared with similar employees uh, in the office. We also see a number of positive benefits in areas like ability to manage work-life conflict, uh, employee satisfaction, reduction in turnover, which all kind of contribute to that uh, positive ROI, I would say. I'd say the one downside, at least from an employee perspective, is the idea that we know that employees that work from home or work remotely are less likely to be promoted than their kind of in-office colleagues, kind of the out of sight, out of mind uh, phenomenon, uh, which is something I think organizations really need to be conscious of. But I think you're right, it's an excellent point, which is, you know, in the current environment, I think we've kind of fallen into this trap of thinking, well, everybody can work remotely because most people are, oh, my light's going off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, we know, I think I saw a recent statistic that 70% of, at least in the US, 70% of workers really can't work remotely, right? Because they need to be on site to perform their jobs. So I think there we could think about, you know, is there an opportunity for more ad hoc flex work and, and other forms of flexibility that might not be uh, full time or even you know more intensive types of, of remote work that still maybe eliminate that have and have not kind of phenomenon that you're referring to. Beth, I don't know if you have kind of other thoughts on this. Yeah, you know what, I, I, this is always a struggle, right? I worked in manufacturing for a long time and you always wanted you know, to seem equitable and fair and you know, have the same things for, for everyone. And, and the reality is that's just not possible in, in some of these environments. And so um, I don't know if we should get to a more candid conversation around you know, what is different and what is good and what is bad because you know, working remotely, um, you know, everybody, it sounds so sexy, right? You wanna do it, you wanna have that flexibility and work remotely, but I think you'll ask a lot of people now that have, have been working virtually for so long and they wanna get back to the office, right? And so it's, it, the grass isn't always greener. And, and I, I think that is hard to, you know, hard to put out there, but I think recognizing the pluses and minuses of the different environments and then rewarding people for what they're doing. So in, in manufacturing these days where they are heading to work, um, they are, you know, risking, taking some risks and doing that, um, you know, giving those ad hoc bonus payments or, or, or other types of things to recognize how their work is different and how, um, you know, and, 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 and rewarding them for that. And at the same time, you know, doing that for folks uh, working remotely. So it, I'm not saying it very well, but it, it is just recognizing the differences, owning those, and then rewarding people for those. And at the same time, trying to open up and be a little bit more flexible where you can. You know, we've all seen that 
you know, many of the, the myths we've held in our own minds around, well, you can't really do training remotely. Well, well, yes, we can, and we are. And so, you know, can we apply any of that to the, to the manufacturing setting as well? Yeah, I saw, I mean, to your point, Beth, I saw in your notes from the working group that there were a few companies that were really kind of looking at almost every job to evaluate, you know, how good of a fit is this job for remote work? And, you know, working with some companies even pre-COVID that had big remote work programs, I would say the best ones were those companies that really had these very systematic processes for evaluating, is this a good fit for the individual? Is this a good fit for the job, the team, and ultimately the organization? And I think if you could do that and you have a really procedurally fair process, so to speak, that evaluates it, I think you can maybe uh, prevent some of those have and have not feelings because people understand the rationale behind the decision decision making. Yeah, yeah. Great. So um, we have a few minutes remaining. Um, welcome any other you know questions. Maybe, Beth, um, we could just quickly touch on the last theme, which is around employee health and well-being. Anything that has stood out there? I mean, obviously a very uh, salient topic right now, but anything that kind of really jumped out in your working group? Yeah, you know, the health perspective is a hard one. Um, you know, companies really struggled at first, I think, to create clear messages and and we're all getting competing messages, you know, from different entities, right, about do you wear a mask or not? Does it make a difference or not? And, you know, it, all of that kind of stuff. And so it's difficult, I think, for companies to wade through that. But I think where HR leaders have, um, have differentiated themselves is, look, we're going to take every step we need to to ensure a safe workplace. And so that's that's job one. And, and that was done really well. Um, other companies, you know, they branched off into into other things, have brought in speakers such as um, a, a prior surgeon general to explain what the virus is and get people comfortable with that, especially if they're having to, to come into a work during these times. Uh, also talking about things like loneliness, mental health, um, uh, companies are using third parties to offer webinars on topics like resilience and, and the others that I just mentioned. Um, and, and as we talked about earlier too, several um, companies mentioned the formation of some newer ERGs uh, focused on mental health would be one area. Parents is another if you hadn't had that before. And then um, on the topics of race and inclusion as well, given, given all that we're experiencing on that front. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I'd say about that. Great. So I know we're almost at the end of our, our time here at 30 minutes. Uh, so uh, just before we wrap up, I wanna thank all of you for, for joining us today. Appreciate the, the questions. A uh, copy of this uh, webcast will be posted to our website. So please uh, share it with others that you think might be uh, interested. Also just wanna highlight that we have uh, several upcoming events uh, that really relate to many of the themes that we've talked about today. So we have two uh, more virtual working groups planned for this fall. On November 5th, uh, I'll be running one focus on uh, disruption and its implications for talent strategy. So how are companies rethinking talent uh, in the current environment? Uh, and then on November 19th, Beth will be doing one focused on the changing environment and its impact on the HRBP role. So please consider registering for those. Uh, also, our partner meeting uh, this fall will be virtual as opposed to being on campus, um, which is great because as many people as uh, uh, you want in your organizations can attend. And it'll be a two-part meeting this year uh, with one session focusing on kind of remote work and how companies are thinking about remote work and flexibility. Uh, not just now, but also in the long term. So Kathy, that might be a good one for you based on your question. Uh, but also on December 8th, we'll be doing another session that will focus on uh, employee health and well-being, and in particular, the role of leaders uh, you know, in kind of managing that. Uh, these will be informed by research that we've been doing through CARS this fall, as well as we'll be featuring a few of our CARS partners that we think are doing some really innovative uh, things in this uh, space. So December 1st and December 8th, you can find more information about all of these events on our website. So please uh, check that out, register for any that are of interest to you, and hopefully we'll see you at a future CARS event. Thanks again for attending today.